Hey there, everybody. It's Mike Delisio, and today I'm going to be starting a small series of videos where I talk about games that I have crowdfunded over the years. And uh, I am somebody that is a relatively frequent user and uh, patron of crowdfunding services for board games. Let's say that I have backed more than 100 games and less than 200. We'll keep it into that range. Um, and primarily those have been through Kickstarter, although in more recent times, uh, GameFound has come into the mix and there are even uh, more companies that are getting involved in crowdfunding for board games. And so what I wanna do today, starting off, is talking about what I'm calling my hits. Now, I need to make it very clear on the front end that I'm talking about the games themselves and where they fit in my collection. I'm not gonna to get too much into the actual campaigns, uh, things that worked and didn't work with those campaigns because part of the issue with crowdfunding is that there are gonna be things that pop up from time to time. There are gonna be delays. There are gonna be some gaps in communication. These things uh, I have learned throughout the years of backing games are going to happen. So I'm not factoring that into the mix with this. For these games that I'm putting on my hits list, these are games that I am considering to be permanent parts of my collection. Uh, ones that uh, I don't see leaving my collection anytime soon. And so that's why uh, I'm, I'm calling them my hits. So let's start right off here with number five. This is Tokaido, the collector's edition. Now, I just got done saying that I'm not gonna talk much about the, uh, the actual campaigns themselves, but this is one that was notoriously late. Uh, I believe it was over a year delayed from being uh, fulfilled. However, when it did fulfill, I uh, was very, very happy with it. As I said, I got the collector's edition, which has these beautiful pre-painted minis and you know, maybe they're not the highest quality paint jobs, but I, I'm not a painter, so I'm perfectly happy with the quality of the minis in, in uh, this uh, edition of the game. It comes with uh, a couple of expansions. It is a strange shaped box, and so that is one thing that can be a little bit tricky as far as like uh, storage, but Overall, this is a, a game that I still look at as almost an heirloom, uh, that I'm, I feel proud to bring it out and show it to people. It's not the heaviest game in the world, it's not a game that's gonna be a real brain burner, but it is a beautiful game that evokes its theme very well, and this edition of the game, I think, does it in it shows it in its best light with these, again, beautiful uh, miniatures and uh, the, the larger board. So um, Tokaido, the collector's edition, is one that I feel is gonna be a hallmark of my collection for years to come. All right, number four is Mass Mora, Dungeons of Arcadia. And boy, yeah, I'm talking about this one again, and I feel like I'm one of the few people that champion this game. And maybe it's just because of where it sits in my collection. So. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I always enjoyed Arcadia Quest. Uh, it was one of the games that uh, I started playing relatively early into the hobby, and I really enjoyed kind of the wackiness and the silliness and the tongue-in-cheek nature of the game. But it was one that I couldn't get to the table as often as I would like. And so when Masmora Dungeons of Arcadia came around and I saw, hey, here's a game now that, that is set in the same world that has some of the same feel, a very different game, but has some of the same feel, but that you can play solo, you can play it cooperatively, you can play it competitively, uh, I was definitely interested. And so uh, when I did eventually get the game, I've been very, very happy with it. It's a game that I still pull out, uh, you know, at least once a year, uh, and I don't see it leaving my collection anytime soon. I probably prefer it as a cooperative or solo game. It's, it's primarily one that I play solo, but I have played it with other people. And uh, I really like the aspect of dice as monsters. I know that uh, that's not for everybody, but for me it works really well. And so I like being able to have my, my, my delving into this world available to me at any time since I can play it solo. So that's number four, Masmora Dungeons of Arcadia. Number three is Near and Far, the beautiful uh, storytelling game from Red Raven Games. And so Near and Far is a game that I backed based off of my enjoyment of Above and Below. And so I had played Above and Below and I thought it was a, a really neat game and thought that it had um, a nice framework with room to grow. And I was hoping that that's what Near and Far would be. And, and I think that that's exactly what it is. Um, it is a game that takes what Above and Below kind of promised and goes even further where you've got this nice mixture of 
some narrative elements, but also a, a strong kind of Euro underpinning for it. And so Near and Far is a game that uh, has come out with an expansion. You can play it cooperatively now. But uh, I like just the base Near and Far uh, experience. I played through the entire campaign. You can play through as just a single character if you want to. It's a game that I still feel holds with the rest of the games in this trilogy. So, you know, Sleeping Gods has come out since, and it's a much larger game in scope. And, you know, narratively, maybe it's even more impressive, but uh, Near and Far is still a game that I have a lot of affection for. It's still a game that I proudly keep in my collection, and it's a game that I definitely will, will, uh, will not regret backing. All right, number two is a relatively new uh, game, and that is Merchant's Cove. This is a game that um, really has has just grown in its estimation for me. I really love the fact that this is an asymmetric game at heart where everybody is playing as a particular merchant, and you are all doing the same thing. You're, you're making goods, small and large goods, but you're all doing it in a slightly different way. And so you might be, you know, doing a little bit of a, a marble, kind of a, a potion explosion type of a thing, or you might be doing a dice placement, or you might be doing a little roll and write type of a thing. But you're all still working within this central framework of trying to sell goods to a market of people who are trying to buy them. And so this is a game that has a lot of room to grow. They've already announced a, an expansion for it, and I'm very excited to be able to add new characters that have new ways to, to interact with this world into the mix. And so Merchant's Cove is a game that um, I don't think is gonna lose its luster. I've played it a lot. I've taught it to a bunch of people, and uh, not everybody likes it as much as I do. I mean, that's gonna be any game, but um, I think that more people have liked it than have not, and it's one that, again, just has so much room to grow and so many ways to kind of interact with the core mechanisms that are on display. And uh, I, for one, am very excited to see uh, what new characters are on, on board, but I'm happy with the ones that I have. Even if they hadn't added any, I think that there's enough there with the, uh, the base, and I did get the expansion characters that, that were offered with that first campaign uh, as well. And so Merchant's Cove has been a, a big hit for me, and it's one that I continue to look forward to, to playing, continue to look forward to teaching, and uh, showing other people as well. All right, and that brings me to my number one. And if you have watched any of my uh, videos in the past, this is probably not gonna be a surprise for you because my number one crowdfunded hit is my number one game of all time now, and that is Dwellings of Eldervale. And uh, wow, this game just knocked me out. Uh, I, I think I remember uh, when, when I first was talking about this game, I was mentioning that when you sometimes you'll play a game and you're like, this is just, I feel like it was made for me. Dwellings of Eldervale is that. It's, it's one of those games that kind of is the hybrid game that I tend to find myself attracted to where it, it has plenty of theme and it has a little bit of combat, but it really is kind of anchored with some solid Euro design, some card play, a bit of area control going on, some individual player powers, a slight asymmetry, although very, very slight, a beautiful, gorgeous, over-the-top production. Um, Dwellings of Eldervale has just done it all for me. It's a game that I just, I, I really am so impressed by how it takes so many different elements and brings them together into a cohesive whole. And apparently it's a game that is now going to be kind of re-implemented into a space theme. And that's cool, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I'm looking for anything to overtake Dwellings of Eldervale for me because it's a game that I still just have so much of an affection for, so much of an enjoyment of, and it's one that I still get excited to get out and play. It's one that I, I still enjoy teaching to players. And so Dwellings of Eldervale is my number one crowdfunded hit of all time. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, what's to come. What's to come? So that's it for me. I'm gonna be coming up with some more videos here, talking about some of the games that didn't work as well for me, and, and also talking about some games that surprised me. Uh, in addition to that, I'll also be having one about anticipated games. So, but for now, that's gonna do it. This is Mike Delicio signing off from Dice Tower Headquarters. Mm.